Hello and welcome to week two. We're going to talk about some of the ancient civilizations of Eurasia, mostly India and China. I touched on this a little bit uh, with the discussion last week in preparation for this week. So we're going to look a little bit at the Indus Valley civilizations, the Zhao civilizations, and also some of the really burning questions that begin to emerge in the late bronze periods. We're going to start off with terms. Hinduism is considered the oldest living religion, although when it was formed, it really is radically different than it is practiced today. Uh, important part to remember about Hinduism, and actually all religions, is that they are living because they are currently being practiced and they're influenced by changes in ideology, changes in scientific reality, understanding of human behavior. And so a practitioner from the modern day who went back in a time machine to, let's say, 500 BCE would hardly recognize Hinduism and vice versa. Uh, the same is true for every single religion. Things change. They don't remain perfect and in violet forever. So uh, Hinduism is considered the oldest living religion uh, and it is based on the so-called Vedic texts and Vedic is a classic period of Sanskrit uh, during which a lot of these uh, belief systems are articulated and Hinduism uh, in a nutshell uh, emphasizes stability over everything else. So we have a very rigid caste system. We have a very uh, finite amount of power that can be shared and the majority of people are kept in some kind of servitude. Now, to counter this, we have the emergence of Buddhism. Uh, Buddhism posited by the, the kind of quasi mythological uh, Siddhartha Gautama uh, believed that uh, Hinduism doesn't do enough to address injustice and suffering and pain. Uh, and there are, uh, it's a very long, complicated story as to how uh, Siddhartha Gautama eventually comes to this uh, understanding of that eventually becomes Buddhism. Um, but essentially, it boils down to uh, breaking the cycle of life, pain, death, and rebirth. Uh, through meditation, reflection, uh, compassionate acts, compassionate, not adding to the misery of other people. Uh, and then eventually, of course, enlightenment. So this is personal salvation. And I mean, literally personal salvation. God plays no part in the original concept of Buddhism. Actually, it's humans who are capable of more enlightened thought than gods. Why? Well, only humans have to struggle. Only humans face death. Therefore, only humans can truly understand life. And therefore, only humans are truly capable of wisdom. Now, let's shift gears and hop on over to China. And in China, we have two competing philosophies. And these are not really religions, although they become pseudo-religious in, uh, in many aspects. Uh, first, we have Confucianism, which is a philosophical approach that believes that uh, a compassionate and harmonious society eventually leads to a stable society, that there's these relationships that need to be protected and, and honored in everybody's life and that by thinking uh, with the idea of how your actions will impact your community that you create uh, this kind of wave of, of um, stability and wisdom and you become a uh, an object of um, of admiration and that people want to emulate you. So the more just you act, the more kind you act, the more selflessly you act, the more it inspires other people to act that way. Legalism is the counter philosophy to that, saying that no matter how many errors we put on, no matter how awesome we think we are, humans at their core are basically corrupt. And that in order to create a society that continues to function, order has to be the prevailing motivation of society. 
Uh, laws are inflexible and usually extremely brutal to keep the uh, disordered in line. And they have to be brutal because uh, they have to be inflexible and they have to be brutal because uh, humans will find a way around it. We love to find loopholes. We love to find exceptions and things like that. Uh, and so uh, the idea of compassion is just basically a license to break laws. Uh, so most of these laws have very harsh penalties and they need to be enforced by an authoritarian figure who has absolute authority and uh, is also ironically held to these laws as well and expects somebody to, to hold him accountable. So now the Bronze Age uh, it gives us the established patterns of life that we would recognize. So we have a comparatively increased urbanization, uh, which means you have a larger amount of people working for pay rather than growing or securing their own food. Think about uh, priestly castes. They get a kind of pay, uh, whether it's through donations or through official sponsorship of the church, uh, I mean, of the uh, by the government, or through ownership of lands or whatever. Anywhere you go, if you have a spiritual caste, a priestly caste, uh, somebody is essentially paying them to do their job. Same thing with artists or architects or military leaders. Uh, you don't see generals going out, well, most of the time you don't see generals going out and tilling their own fields. Uh, and before you note uh, Cincinnatus, in, in the classic image of him plowing the field, uh, probably not. He was more, he was closer to a southern plantation slave owner. Uh, he may have worked in the field occasionally, but mostly he relied upon slaves to do his work for him. So basically somebody else's labor is paying for his upkeep. Uh, in, with this increased disparity in people's roles in society, there are comes, at least theoretically, increased injustice. A larger number of people are oppressed by stronger elites, such as aristocracy, royalty, uh, the, the priestly caste, uh, the warrior caste, you name it. So we have uh, people who are increasingly disconnected from the large society that they lead. Uh, whether you're talking about a pharaoh, and I believe you might have read a little bit about the story of Gilgamesh and talk about disconnected from the people you lead, there you have it. Uh, and so this leads us to important questions. Morality, for example. We have a sense of morality, of what's right and what's wrong, don't we? Uh, what is the purpose of power? Why are people in power? Are they simply in power because they got one over on the rest of us or are they in power because it's supposed to bring some kind of benefit to a large amount of people then who is that large amount of people and then also uh the people in power create laws don't they and what is the nature of laws where do laws come from why do we need laws and who do these laws protect those are important questions that we are still struggling with today. So please give them a little bit of uh, a little bit of consideration when we go through these philosophies and these societies. Now there are ancient attempts, and of course they do have shortfalls. Uh, in Mesopotamia, for example, they had literally flood insurance. Uh, all debt, all writings were kept on clay tablets that were uh, inscribed with letters. Uh, with a device called the stylus. It's uh, basically a reed, a triangular shaped reed. Uh, and you create these, these different markings that are the words. Uh, and you would create a contract on this tablet. And if for whatever reason, the gods took away your, your harvest through like an act of divine intervention, things like floods or droughts or whatever like that, uh, you could go down to the river and you could wash your clay tablet. This essentially washes away your debt. It rehydrates uh, your little clay tablet, uh, it becomes muddy again and it turns into mud and it's gone. And the person who owned you, uh, who, uh, you owed money, well, that's the risk you take when you flirt with the gods, right? So, uh, 
with it with a uh, great risk there there's also uh the possibility of losing it all uh and then of course we have hammurabi's code hammurabi's code oversimplified if we can is basically simplistic justice an eye for an eye a tooth for a tooth so if i accidentally strike out your eye uh there was an accident at the construction site and you lose an eye i have to have mine gouged out to pay for it uh, that seems overly simplistic, doesn't it? It was a complete accident. I didn't intend for that. So where does intent come from? Uh, it doesn't matter with simplistic justice. Early Egypt also has this concept of divine intervention, where Mesopotamia really didn't have this idea of an afterlife. The Egyptians do. There is this sense of an afterlife that uh, after you die, Thoth, weighs your heart against the uh, against a single feather if your heart is heavier than a feather uh you are cast into oblivion and consumed by this this beast that devours your soul uh if not you go on to live in the afterlife if you've led a just and righteous life you get to go on uh and live in a kind of um replica of your life on earth but without pain without suffering without need uh and so it's very metaphysical so it's hard to enforce metaphysical uh justice isn't it i mean we still have that today we have this idea that god will punish you you will go to hell that sort of thing but does that stop people from doing bad things you could probably go up and say to the person who's embezzling or who is uh, uh, murdering people and say, you're going to go to hell and you're going to burn for all eternity and all this sort of things. And, and will it stop them? Probably not. Most people don't. They usually don't stop doing what they're doing until they are uh, physically punished on this planet. So these oversimplistic laws can be cumbersome and can be overly harsh. Uh, metaphysical laws lack enforcement power. And so injustice continues. You have abuses of power, uh, people who are immune to laws. Uh, a good example of this would be the uh, when we go to the Roman period, we'll talk about the Senate. And the Senate is supposed to make laws that apply to the entire society equally. Uh, but increasingly, the Senate makes themselves immune to laws. Uh, that's true today in the United States. Uh, Congress has made themselves immune to many, many laws. For example, libel laws. Uh, a senator who doesn't like you can write something about you, uh, and it could be completely false, it could be completely made up, uh, but you cannot sue the senator for, uh, for libel or for slander uh, because they are immune to those libel laws. Uh, same thing they are immune to insider trading laws they're immune there's a whole list of laws so you have these abuses of power and immunity to laws so keep that in mind as we move into the indus valley which i think i miss, missed up a little bit there there's supposed to be a why there with the indus valley so the indus valley civilization is a relatively recently discovered one in the middle of the 19th century uh, some mounds that were believed to be hills were uncovered to actually be cities uh, they were old old cities and it's been in uh, continuous uh, excavation since the 1920s uh, the British government in conjunction with the then Indian government and now the Pakistani government uh, have been ex uh, exhuming what we call the Indus Valley or IVC societies, uh, Harapan, Mohenjo-Daro, uh, Arivi, and a few others, Lothal, a few other uh, city-states. Uh, one of the most successful civilizations in the ancient world. We know this because uh, they have these massive, well laid out civil uh, cities. Uh, they are laid out on a grid. They have hot and cold running water. They seem to have sewage systems. They seem to have practiced early dentistry and pain relief. Uh, they utilized uh, poppy seeds uh, and um, uh, and marijuana for pain relief. Uh, and so what happened to these civilizations? They're often called one of the many lost civilizations and we're going to meet another lost civilization uh, because these societies seem to have just up and been abandoned and we don't know why precisely well 
there are some theories, and I'll go over some of those theories, but for our purposes, we're going to say that these societies were eventually abandoned despite their success. So the Indus Valley Society uh, had been a center of human activity. Again, we settle by rivers because, you know, water is nice. Uh, the Indus Valley may have been occupied by these small agricultural communities, uh, Neolithic agricultural communities, as far back as 7000 BCE. Uh, we can carbon date those all the way back to roughly then, or actually 6980-ish, 6980-ish BCE, so about 7000 BCE. Uh, around 2600 BCE, we have what's called the integration period, when a lot of these little teeny settlements become large enough that they become um, competitive and maybe interactive with each other. They don't seem to become warlike with each other. There doesn't seem to be a large warrior caste that emerges, uh, or there doesn't seem to be very much evidence of warfare. And so this integration period uh, in the late stone, early bronze, early copper age, around 2600 BCE, uh, is when the language seems to have been unified. Uh, measurements seem to have been codified uh, because then you get uh, uh, different uh, weights and scales, for example, that are excavated. And so you have this homogenization of the culture, you have the blending of these different uh, small cities or small settlements into a larger culture, uh, much in the same way that the Mesopotamian uh, culture becomes unified uh, through interaction and competition and cooperation, although less so through warfare. The IVC becomes uh, an expanding society. Uh, it becomes one of the centers of power, influence, uh, largely because of geography. They, they have settlements or colonies as far away as Turkmenistan, which is over by the, the uh, Caspian Sea. So it's, it's several hundreds of miles away. And there's evidence of trade across uh, the Iranian plateau with Mesopotamia because products that were created in Mesopotamia that can be traced back to uh, modern day Iraq are found in uh, the Indus Valley civilizations during these excavations. A good example would be Mohenjo-Daro and again I messed up with the, uh, with the placement of these, of these pictures and I apologize for that. Uh, Mohenjo-Daro is an extremely orderly city. It seems to have been subject to urban planning, so it didn't grow up organically. Somebody decided, you know what, we're going to start this city and this is how we're going to build it. And it's laid out on a grid with right angles, which if you are a, um, a urban planner, if you have any sense of urban planning before, say, the 19th century, you know this is extremely rare. Uh, if you go to Europe, uh, if you go to um, Asia, you know a lot of these cities are very organic. They, they grow up along paths, and people don't tend to walk in straight lines naturally. We follow the contours of the land, so these, these roads tend to be very windy. Uh, they can be confusing. It's kind of like this, this warren-like maze. Um, so it takes specific, um, very rigid, very purposeful planning to create right angle streets and square buildings. Um, they also seem to have free flowing water, water that comes into your home. So if you're gonna go back in time, this would be a good time to go back to because you have running water and it does appear they have uh, sewage, sewage systems that drain away human waste. That is one of the downsides to settled society. Uh, if you're a hunter-gatherer or you're a semi-nomadic society, uh, where you poop doesn't really matter. It, it, it doesn't. Uh, it's just as bad as the animals you're following. Who cares, right? But if you are in a settled society and you have to go to the bathroom and everybody poops, so what happens when you have a dozen people pooping in the same place? Well, then you start getting bacteria. 
and you start getting uh, maybe vermin and you get flies and you get the smell and all this sort of stuff. Well, what if you have more than a dozen? What if you have hundreds? What if you have thousands? What if you have tens of thousands of people pooping every day? How do you prevent people from getting sick? How do you prevent cholera and dysentery and typhus and all these nasty diseases? Well, one of the easy ways is to use some of that water runoff, some of that extra water runoff, uh, to shunt it into a river and hopefully it all floats away. Of course, you may have noticed the little downside to that. Uh, where do you get your water from? A river. Who might live upstream from you? People. What might they be doing? Well, dumping their poo in the river. There you go. So, but at least it's an attempt. It's an attempt to carry away the vectors of disease. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a central temple or palace. So we're wondering if there was some kind of monarchy, uh, if it was a council, was it led by a kind of senate type of thing? Uh, so we don't know. Uh, we're speculating on our government types, but it wouldn't be unusual to have a decentralized uh, government without some authoritarian in power for a long period of time. It happens again. It happens again in uh, in Greece. It happens again in Rome. It happens again in the United States. Uh, but they are very brief periods. These these brief periods of people government. They they do tend to disappear. Uh, the default mode for humans is to follow some uh, nut monkey who who grabs power, uh, becomes drunk with power, abuses his position, uh, utilizes it to enrich his, his friends and his family, and doesn't really give a flying fig about uh, the common people. Uh, not that we know anything about that. So uh, the evidence of their disappearance suddenly um, used to be chalked up to some kind of invasion. Uh, it was believed about, oh, about the first, uh, first millennia BCE that these foreign invaders came in about the same time the Hittites did to Mesopotamia, that these other foreigners came into the Indus Valley civilizations. And these foreigners, quote unquote foreigners, were called uh, the Aryans, A-R-Y-A-N-S, not to be confused with the Aryan race that the Third Reich tried to shoehorn people into, which is complete nonsense. Anyway, um, and the belief is that because the uh, Indus Valley civilization was not very warlike, they fell victim very quickly. That was the prevalent belief because in history, excuse me, in history that has happened before. Uh, however, the fact that the riverbeds upon which most of these societies depended upon seem to have shifted gives us a different clue as to their disappearance. Now, as arrogant as we are in the 21st century, we are still dependent upon the environment. Mother Nature, as evidenced by the hurricane that just came in through Texas, uh, doesn't really care about humans. And so things can happen. So what caused the disappearance? Well, the IVC disappears very quickly, leaving little trace behind. And of course, I mentioned the Aryans before, but it doesn't seem that that is the case. Uh, there's a little bit of controversy. Well, there's a lot of controversy. First off, uh, there doesn't seem to be any climactic battles. Usually there's evidence of fire and some kind of destruction when there's an invasion, especially in cities. That doesn't seem to be present. Uh, and so the Aryans might instead have been a faction or a tribe within the IVC society that eventually takes power after a natural disaster, some kind of environmental disaster. Uh, a good example would be drought. Uh, several years without rain can definitely put a damper on all the precautions you may have taken to secure food, the surplus of food being held in like say government silos and then doled out as we have uh, shortfalls in harvest. Well, if that goes on for too long, eventually you do run out. It's a very finite resource. So possibly drought. Uh, there's also earthquakes uh, that, that can shift the course of rivers. And that's where we get our dry riverbed. 
Uh, a lot of people think that the river, like say the Mississippi River or the Ohio River or whatever, are are there forever and they will always be there forever. No, they won't. Uh, they they will shift if if you have a powerful enough earthquake that makes uh, a new hill or a new mountain appear uh, way way upstream it'll shift the direction that the water goes uh, so if it shifts the way the water goes well there goes the city the city's livelihood so Arians however Arians are responsible not for the collapse of the uh, Indus Valley civilizations, but they are responsible for the rise of Hinduism because it's the Aryans who codify the belief systems in Sanskrit, an ancient dead language, uh, in what's called the Vedic text, that period texts. Uh, it's a series of writings and books and musings and kind of ruminations on society. And they establish a very hierarchical society, a very rigid society that we know as the caste structure. At the very top, we have the ethnic Aryans, uh, the, the so-called Brahmin caste. They are the very tippy top of the society. Then we have the warriors and rulers, which is warriors, kings, and so on, which is called the Kshatriya. Uh, and then you have the Vaisyas, which are the skilled traders, merchants, uh, and people like that, uh, the things that keep the society moving. Uh, money is good. Order is good. Bureaucracy is good. Okay, so yeah, you get a little bit of a, you get a little bit of a break. You're not quite as well off as being a soldier or being a priest, uh, but you're doing fairly well. Below that, you have the the unskilled workers, usually the uh, the farmers, uh, the day laborers, uh, anybody who can lift something. So it doesn't take a lot of skill to to do that. Uh, and then eventually, over time, emerges the pariahs or the uh, Harisians. Um, what uh, Gandhi referred to as the children of God, uh, they are at the very, very bottom of society. Now, where do they come from? Uh, that's a, a whole nother class on, on uh, Indian society uh, and the emergence of India, the history of India. Uh, I encourage you to take that class because it gets very complicated and very knotted up. But we, we will reserve this by saying these are people that were conquered. Uh, as the Aryans do spread out from the Indus Valley and start to conquer most of the northern part of India, they do take subject peoples. And of course, uh, one of the great keys to keeping people placid is uh, telling a certain restive minority who may be towards the bottom, who may be poor and exploited, that at least they're not these people uh, and subject the outsiders, these pariahs, to all kinds of, of harsh punishments. Just to think uh, Jim Crow laws. Uh, poor white Southerners were kept kind of in line with racist ideology. And essentially, the pariah class is a form of racism. So that leads us to some important questions about Hinduism. What, what about human potential? What about if somebody's a really good mathematician, but they happen to be born into the pariah caste? What if they're a really crappy warrior and they just they just don't understand how to use a sword properly? Uh, what if they would be better off as a farmer? Where does that fit into this? What about human purpose? Is our purpose merely to go to work, to provide, to serve, and then to die? Is that it? Is that all there is to life? That seems rather uh, bleak, doesn't it? I mean, how do we differ from ants then? What about human compassion? What does sentimentality have? Uh, why do we feel for people if feelings are irrelevant? Why do we you know, cry when we see a child starving to death? Why do we object when somebody is beaten uh, for no reason, no apparent reason, right? Uh, Hinduism is very vague about what happens after you die in general. They're, they have specific things, but it's very vague, the mechanisms, and exactly how this is enforced. Uh, and these, these afterlife punishments do very little to affect the massive suffering that's happening to hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, and that is one of the underlying things that we have to 
really stop and think about. We've gone in the span of a week in our time together, we've gone from very early settled societies to thousands of people, to tens of thousands of people, to hundreds of thousands of people. And we very easily get into the millions. Uh, when we're in our classic period here, a rough, roughly zero BCE, or I'm sorry, there is no zero BCE, one BCE or one AD, um, we have roughly about six million, five million people on the planet, the majority of which are in China and India. So we have hundreds of thousands of people that are suffering. So why isn't Hinduism working? Well, that was a question that uh, one particularly well-off Hindu struggled with. Uh, Siddhartha Gautama, also known as the Buddha, uh, there are many Buddhas. There's like the fat Buddha you find in Chinese restaurants that is just kind of laughing. Uh, that is a Buddha, not the Buddha. Uh, the Buddha, it means the enlightened one. Uh, Siddhartha Gautama, he was an, a member of the elite uh, Brahmin caste. And so he had everything he could possibly want for. Uh, in fact, the story goes that he, his parents made sure that he would never see anybody get sick, never see anybody age, never see anybody die. And at one point he's going through a village and he sees an old beggar man, uh, which was shocking to his sensibilities. And he didn't understand why that man was old, why he was sick, why he was poor. And so he, the shocking event, um, wakes him up. He gets woke for lack of a better term. Uh, and he seeks a, a pursuit of justice, an ending of the cycle of grief and pain that must be broken. Initially, he embraces this ascetic lifestyle, which is a, a um, an extreme form of self-denial. Um, so he, he got in with a bunch of uh, meditative monks, uh, refused to eat, he didn't indulge in speaking or sex or um, food or whatever. And eventually he, he realizes that there's a problem with asceticism. Asceticism is as narcissistic as hedonism. That in a, in a way, the use of, uh, of your, that your motivations really do play a role in why you're doing what you're doing. And that uh, asceticism is a flip side of of the narcissism and of the of the hedonism of the rich class so he redefines a belief system into what's called the middle path what eventually becomes called buddhism and buddhism believes in reincarnation just like hinduism that there's life death and re rebirth straight up from the hinduism however uh, they kind of articulate and deviate from Hinduism uh, in this idea of divine punishment. Divine punishment becomes more personal. If bad things are happening to you, you probably deserve them. You probably did something somewhere along the line that uh, in, in your earlier life, uh, when you were younger, that eventually set into motion a series of events that uh, like this kind of Rube Goldberg kind of uh, machine eventually come around to bite you. Uh, the, they also uh, articulate this idea, this uh, Hindu idea of Dharma, this idea of wisdom, uh, but instead of ascribing dharma or wisdom to the gods and the gods doling it out like special candy to mortals, that actually mortals can attain perfect wisdom. So in many ways, this dharma is more sovereign to each individual. That through meditation, through reflection, through compassionate acts, you can become more moral. Uh, and as you become more moral, you become wiser. You start seeing the effects that your actions have on sustaining uh, a cycle of violence, a, a cycle of hate, greed, and suffering. Ignorance is another good one like that. Human desires are all tied, tightly bound in some of these negative feelings. And so being able to let go of human desires allows you to reclaim uh, a centering of peace, a centering of harmony, 
and uh, a good example. All right. Now I want you to think about a thing that you owe. It could a thing that you own. It could be your car. It could be your plasma TV. It could be your house. It could be anything. And just think of a physical object that you are extremely proud of owning. Now imagine you wake up one morning and find that it has been smashed that uh, somebody at some point decided that you don't deserve that and they smash it and they set it on fire uh, they they tear it apart think about how that would affect you would you be okay with that or would it generate a negative feeling most people would generate a negative feeling. Let's take, for example, a car. You just bought a brand new car, first brand new car you've had in a long time. It's your pride and joy. You take care of it, whatever. And then you come out one morning and somebody has spray painted giant penises on it and smashed the windows and stolen the tires and ripped out the engine and, and done all this stuff. Immediately, you, you start getting angry. And where does anger lead you? It leads you to negative emotions. It, ma it makes you, it makes you uh, more snappy at work. So maybe you, um, you seem grumpy at work, or maybe you seem dejected at work, or maybe it bothers you because you're getting a runaround from the insurance company because uh, it, it happened in a place where they told you not to park or whatever. You know, for whatever reason, they're just dragging their feet on getting your, getting you a replacement vehicle. It's that ownership of those objects. It's that ownership of the world that creates your suffering and you inflict suffering on other people. Maybe you want vengeance. Maybe you want to go beat up somebody. Maybe you want to take it out on a coworker or there's somebody comes in and they're annoying. You need to break that by releasing your hold upon the car that you release the car's hold upon you releasing your hold upon the house. You release the house's hold upon you. If you realize that eventually all things crumble and fade, that they will be broken, that they will be stolen, that they will be destroyed. If you release that, you free yourself up to act compassionately and to be introspective and to see that you can break the cycle and attain nirvana. Now, nirvana is not heaven per se. It is a breaking of the cycle of pain, suffering, death rebirth and starting the whole thing over again and all of existence is linked in a chain of causality so if you're angry and maybe you take it out on a student and maybe that student goes home and they take it out on a brother or sister or family member or maybe the you know and it's very you know improbable that they maybe they hurt themselves right Maybe from there, them hurting themselves causes pain and grief for the family, all because my car was destroyed, all because a random act of violence. And why did that person destroy my car? Maybe they were envious. Maybe they were angry. Maybe that sort of thing. If I take it responsibility to change uh, the direction of the energy, then uh, I can help break that cycle of peace. Uh, it does go on to... Uh, to the West. Buddhism does uh, spread West, as you see here. It does filter into the Iranian plateau and into eventually uh, Mesopotamia and seems to influence Zoroastrian, which also seems to influence Christian ideology, the idea of turning the other cheek. So Buddhism initially uh, becomes a very popular religion because it offers an alternative to Hinduism, but it eventually uh, it falls prey to the status quo, the, the dominant religion, uh, which is the articulated by the Brahmins and, in, and enforced by the Kshatriya, uh, portray Buddhism as an alien and invasive religion uh, and uh essentially drives it underground it does however spread throughout asia and to what we refer to as the middle east or the near east uh and influences chinese society vietnamese korean japan persian uh and others and in in fact uh it may have filtered all the way to uh, to the mediterranean where it influenced so-called mystery cults in greece and rome 
Speaking of filtering into China, let's go ahead and shift focus and look at the Zhao Confederacy of China. The Zhao Confederacy was one of several successful early kind of, uh, we're going to use the term kingdom because it we use both the term kingdom and confederacy with uh, the Zhao dynasty because it's kind of a hybrid between the two. Uh, in a confederacy, all states are equal or all actors are equal and there has to be 100% consensus. Unfortunately, that doesn't really play out in reality. Getting people to agree on, let's say, toppings for a pizza is nearly impossible if you, the larger you, you make the group. Uh, so imagine trying to agree on uh, how, how to run a government. So you do have a kind of sort of confederacy, but also a kind of sort of kingdom from about 1040 BCE to about 250 BCE. The Yellow River is the main river along which the Zhao Confederacy arises, and the Yellow River allows for, like the Indus Valley civilization, early agriculture, and we have these early settlements that spring up around 8000 BCE. Remember when I told you that farming uh, evolved first and then later writing evolves? That's true, particularly here in China. Um, so you have these uh, these settlements that eventually uh, integrate, and by the time we get to about a thousand BCE, uh, we have a, a Zhao or Chao China, and that organization and that innovation prove extremely effective. Eventually, they're able to push further and further south and establish um, uh, enclaves along the Yangtze River, uh, and these rivers are extremely important to Chinese history and understanding how China becomes so successful. Now, the Northern Yellow River is very rich in mud. That's why it's called yellow. It's got this kind of yellowish brown mud that it brings with it. And it brings these very big floods that are very rich for soil when they recede uh, into a relatively dry environment. In the north of China, it is a lot like uh, Kansas and Nebraska. So relatively dry. And they grow uh, millet. And millet is a form, uh, it's, a, it's a grain uh, that is, I think you would most recognize it in bird seed now. It's a little teeny balls, uh, but actually they can be like popcorn. You can treat it like popcorn. You can treat it like a like a wheat and create a flour out of it. Uh, it's a very nutritious ancient grain. Now, the Yellow River is also known as the Scourge of China due to sudden changes in elevation uh, as well as the course of the river. So it shifts a lot. It's a very unpredictable river. The river is actually used as a weapon uh, in the later Warring States period. Uh, upstream, they dam up the river, uh, let a lot of water build up, and then they break the dam, uh, which then goes rushing downstream and wipes out entire villages. So that's kind of a, a jerk move to do. Further to the south, we have the Yangtze River. Uh, it carves its way through more mountainous terrain, so it doesn't shift quite as much. Uh, in the north, you have relatively flat uh, plains. Uh, in the south, you have more mountains. It's a relatively wetter climate. Uh, and it seems early settlements date back as far back as 27,000 BCE. So that gives you an idea where the, uh, the uh, Neolithic Revolution may have actually taken root first. Uh, but it remains relatively sparsely settled because of the difficult mountainous terrain. So you can only have small settlements uh, without a, some kind of bigger government coming from outside and, and kind of uh, consolidating everything. Uh, the, the river is navigable uh, by deep hulled vessels, which makes it easier to trade uh, and to move around uh, up and down the river. So the Zhao were extremely specialized uh, settled societies, much like the Mahanjadaro and Harapan, the IVC uh, city-states, they had uh, access to massive trade networks and were made extremely wealthy by it. Uh, a good example of this would be the trade in silk, which very early on becomes uh, one of the money makers for the Zhao Confederacy. 
silk emerges seems to have emerged around 3000 BCE and by 300 just before the collapse of the Zhao Confederacy <coughs> excuse me just before the collapse of the Zhao Confederacy uh, silk becomes commonplace uh, silk is a wonderful material it's it's extremely uh, pleasant to the touch uh, it is very rare it was initially only grown in very far eastern asia in china uh, and so you hold the monopoly on the production of it the zhao were also experienced bronze workers uh, they were very good technologically with bronze uh, and of course they eventually developed a codified approach to um, to acupuncture uh, a traditional medicine that had been used around the world for thousands of years um, so acupuncture is uh, essentially boils down in Zhao Confederacy to the manipulation of energy lines uh, in the body. Uh, these energy lines are roughly correspondent to the nervous system, so they weren't completely off uh, about the use of of acupuncture. It was it's fantastic for uh, pain relief to re alleviate swelling in joints for arthritis. Uh, it's really good for helping to interrupt some uh, some spasms and uh, to promote healing. Um, so these they, they began to believe that they were manipulating the energy that flows through the body and that uh, the chi became blocked uh, through trauma or illness and it could be unblocked through acupuncture. Now that is a little kind of quack medicine. Uh, so acupuncture and acupressure do have their roles and they do wind up being very uh, useful even in today's medicine, uh, but they can be mixed with some misunderstandings as well. Eventually, however, the, the Zhao Confederacy does run into problems. Uh, it collapses into what we refer to as the Warring States period around uh, 278 BCE. Uh, and this period is when um, the different clients of the Zhao Confederacy, that central uh, authority, kind of break up. You can imagine if the 13 colonies of the United States uh, had kept the Articles of Confederation and eventually became squabbling little petty states where Pennsylvania declares war on Virginia and New York tries to annex uh, Connecticut, that sort of thing. So you have this warring states period. Eventually, uh, the ruling class does emerge, uh, but it's not for several decades. And during this period, uh, we like to think of the Warring States period as a period of continual battle, of people just raising armies and attacking each other left and right, and massive carnage. Uh, actual battles, uh, like pitched battles, don't really happen all that often. There's a lot of skirmishes where you have some losses, and of course you don't want to lose your entire army because you just spent a lot of money training them. Uh, and if you lose your army, it's really hard to raise another one, and you become a victim to one of your neighbors so you have these skirmishes uh, and so you have these regional warlords who are very jealous of their power and they can often engage in harsh brutal rule uh, these regional warlords can sometimes be on top but it's often very short-lived uh, for only uh, i think the shortest one was three months and the longest one was a few years uh, until the end of this period when the Qin dynasty arises this regional warlordism leads to regional instability, of course, because there are uh, w armies that are being conscripted, people are being pulled into the army, means you're pulling people off of the fields to train to become warriors, which means you have fewer people working the fields, and all it takes is just a little bit of short rainfall or maybe a shortage of manpower, and you have famine. And when you have famine and people starve, lots of times you see also the rise of banditry. People uh, run to the forests or they run to the mountains and they begin to prey upon trade, which then of course quashes trade. So you have a, a, a reduction in food and a reduction in money and it leads to even more instability. And so you have this series of on again, off again wars that are devastating to trade and agricultural, uh, agricultural production. 
and it becomes known as one of the Chinese Dark Ages. There are several Dark Ages throughout human history. Uh, the medieval period of European history is probably one of the more famous Dark Ages. There's one in the Mediterranean period after the collapse of uh, of ancient era uh, Greece and before the rise of classical era Greece. Uh, and so the Zhao Confederacy is lost and all record of the Zhao Confederacy is lost during and slightly after this Warring States period. During this Warring States period, we have this man named Kong Futsi, also known as Confucius. And again, I apologize for the positioning here uh, of the picture. It just, I don't know what I was doing with this one, I guess. Just wasn't paying attention. So uh, Kong Fu Zi is this itinerant historian and philosopher, and he lived during the Warring States period, but he was early enough that he remembered the more uh, placid Zhao Confederacy. Uh, and he travels about as a young historian, uh, as an itinerant teacher, and he learns about people, places, their history, and he teaches those who are willing to pay him. Uh, or, or I'm sorry, who are willing to learn him, uh, learn from him regardless of pay. Uh, kind of an admirable figure, right? Um, as he travels throughout the Warring States, he begins to hone his reputation as a wise and just philosopher. Uh, he attempts to reform government through uh, contemplation and through reinforcing of these social bonds that we should have, uh, these special relationships that we all have in our lives. And what are those relationships? Well, uh, within the Confucian philosophy, there are five relationships. There is ruler to ruled, parent to child, older sibling to younger sibling, wife or husband to wife, and friends amongst each other. And each person in this relationship has a responsibility to the other person in this relationship to act uh, with kindness, with mercy, with compassion, to be thoughtful in your approach to interacting with him. So, for example, if you are a parent and your child comes to you and they're, I don't know, they're, they're snotty or they're, they're just disrespectful, uh, you can tell them they're being disrespectful, but you also want to find out why are they suddenly being disrespectful? Are they angry at you or is something else out there angering them? And to, arrive at the root of the problem, not to just fly off the handle and, uh, you know, punch the child in the face or whatever like that, right? Or same thing with uh, a ruler to a ruled. The ruler has a responsibility to his subjects, and it's always his. Sorry, ladies, we're not that enlightened yet. Uh, so the ruler has a, a responsibility to their subjects that they have to uh, when they pass laws, they have to consider, will this benefit the majority of the people or will it benefit only me? If it benefits the majority of the people, for instance, a ban on stealing horses, right? Ban on stealing horses helps the broadest amount of people. But within that within that frame, okay, we're banning stealing horses. What, what if somebody needs to borrow a horse real quick to run and go get help? Are they still a horse thief? What if they're, uh, what if they find the horse? The horse has run away from home and they find it in the field and they're like, hey, look at that, a horse. Are they now a horse thief? So there has to be compassion in there. And also Confucianism uh, believes in meritocracy, that uh, essentially uh, the heavens, the sense of order has bestowed upon leaders a sense of, of duty and almost a magical ability to gather people to them and to make them follow follow them largely based upon their best morals. That's the idea. It's a very kind of wide-eyed belief system, but we'll roll with it. And he does attempt to reform government. Confucius is never really given an important job in his lifetime. At one point, he is made sheriff of one of the more troubled towns uh, in what would later become known as China. Uh, and by all accounts, he is fairly successful in that. He instills in uh, the police, the constabulary, this idea of Confucian uh, responsibility to the, to the society. Uh, and he does reform it, but he's eventually fired because he's embarrassing. <laughs> you know, here he's 
carving order out of disorder imagine being put in charge of i don't know chicago or detroit or something like that uh and doing a good job of it and getting people to follow you uh so his influence however spreads because after his death his students compile his learnings into a book called the analects uh, eventually he becomes accepted but not for a long time and in fact he becomes the most influential um, um, Chinese philosopher of all time uh, to a degree that that Confucianist ideology still uh, holds in China today this uh, emphasis on scholarship that you have to work hard that it's your duty as a child uh, to do well in school so you reflect well upon your family and upon your parents now there is a counter to Confucianism. Confucianism can be overly intellectual and so there is an emergence of a philosophy called Taoism which is uh, which literally means the way uh, in which the uh, the philosophy is that uh, you think too much that you should uh, that wisdom true wisdom cannot be really known you only intuit it and that action causes reaction uh, and you can learn to be a person without having to go to an official school or learn a certain philosophy or learn these certain steps right uh, and so many times Taoism argued that education can lead to injustice that you become overly intellectual and so you become paralyzed by indecision and so it allows injustice to flourish uh, an even more extreme counter to Confucianism is legalism. Legalism is pessimistic, ruthless, and unyielding. Confucianism is very reflective, very compassionate, very, you know, there's a lot of wiggle room, some gray areas that you can play around in there. Uh, legalism, black and white, off and on, good and bad, period. Okay. Human nature is inherently bestial, inherently evil, and therefore punishments must be horrific in order to impose order. Now, this, this philosophy is actually adopted by the Qin dynasty. Uh, the Qin is one of the warring kingdoms, uh, and eventually the first emperor of China, Qin Shi Huangdi, seizes control of the warring states and subjugates them. Uh, he is a rigid, dynamic person. He continues to hold on to uh, that authoritative power even after he becomes emperor. And all decisions, every single decision, big or small, falls to him he didn't get very much sleep he may have also been suffering from uh ocd and rage issues he was definitely insane he was obsessed with living forever uh he used to drink mercury as part of his medicine he believed that it would help him make it would help make him live forever uh and anybody who knows anything about medicine knows that drinking a heavy metal is probably not the best thing to do for somebody who is psychotic, uh, but there you are. And he propounds and, and codifies uh, legalism. He adopts this philosophy first posited by a philosopher named Han Feizi, uh, and his, uh, uh, Qin Shi Huangdi's laws are in line with uh, legalist philosophy that harsh laws need to have brutal punishments and they need to be completely inflexible order is paramount and you can understand where that motivation comes from uh, most of the penalties are capital uh, for example theft means you die um, for legalism it's not just you know beheading or hanging somebody um it's a choice between being buried alive being crushed by an elephant or being boiled in oil so you get to choose right uh and so what are some of the laws that you can be accused of breaking and then result in uh capital punishment well uh adultery is another one if you're caught uh catching yeah, a little bit of strange on the side. Uh, you can be crushed by an elephant or boiled in oil. 
really kind of dissuades you from wanting to to stray outside your marriage uh owning confucius writings uh confucian writings become banned under uh chin chi huang di and anybody caught holding on to those and anybody caught being a confucius uh monk uh would be crushed by an elephant or buried alive uh often with their with their teachings uh so they would dig a hole about 10 feet deep put you in the bottom of it and start filling it in shovel by shovel so it would slowly uh either suffocate you or cr or crush you or you know crush you while suffocating you so not very nice nice not very nice or compassionate punishments it does however give a new name to this middle kingdom qin dynasty lends its name to china and it is still known as china today so ancient civilizations are being reconstructed in the contemporary age through scientific investigation. Now, last week I asked you, what, how do things become lost? How do civilizations become lost? And what happens to the people of these civilizations? Did they just disappear? Can all legends be true? Or can all legends be false? Is there a middle ground between lost civilizations and real civilizations? All right, guys, that is it for this week. Uh, homework is read chapters three and four about the Indus Valley and Chinese civilizations. Quiz number two is open. I also have some activities that you need to participate in. Those additional resources and activities are to help round out your understanding of these periods uh, and particularly of Indian, ancient Indian and ancient Chinese society. Uh, it's also part of your grade, so please do participate. If you're not clicking on them, I can't give you credit for them. If you're not getting credit for them, it's going to hurt your grade in the end. Okay. If you have any problems with the material, please do email me. All right. That's it for today. You guys have a great one. I'll see you again next week.